What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. This is BDGE, 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 big dog guy, E fantasy football. I am Nicholas. Today, 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 on this beautiful, beautiful Tuesday morning at 5 a.m., 5 a.m. Eastern time every day is when my videos and podcasts go out. People don't get it twisted. I want to look at legitimate league winning upside running backs. I'm not talking about, oh, if Kenyon Drake goes down, Chase Edmonds is a league winner. Like, no, he's not. He's probably the RB12 or RB14, and the f***ing RB14 is not winning you a damn thing in fantasy football. I'm talking about the Christian McCaffreys of last year, the Todd Gurley's of 2018 and 2017, the ones who, if you have on your roster, 75% chance you're in the chip. So here's what we did for this. Here is the criteria. The first thing we did was drop the intro on you motherfuckers. So in all seriousness, looking at a, a half PPR perspective, a league winning running back, what I did to decipher a league winning running back was take any running back that has averaged 20 fantasy points per game over the course of the season. That is league winning. They are the truly elite running back. So I use the Rotoviz screener app, which is a fantastic app on Rotoviz's website. It is behind a paywall though, so it's not free. And I narrowed down all of the running backs over the last 12 years, I don't know why I took 12, I just took 12, to identify all of the running backs that average over 20 fantasy points per game in a given season, minimum 12 games played, and that narrowed it down to 20 running backs over the last 12 years, which sounds about right, right? You have about one, maybe two real league winning running backs per year. So what I wanted to do was I got into the, the headquarter brainstorm, compile these running backs into one crazy ass chart, and see what kind of similarities we can come away with, see what kind of numbers or stats that we might be wrongfully looking at as a fantasy community where we're putting too much on a pedestal or not looking at enough to decipher who are these guys even if they're picked at the back half of the first round maybe the early third round like what tendencies or what traits of their role in their offense do they need to have in order to possibly be that league winning running back so we looked at things just like overall touches touchdowns receptions targets the team that they're on offensive points per game the offensive line ranking to see what we could identify here so this chart i understand this has a lot of of stuff going on here if you are listening via podcast what i would suggest you do is hop over to youtube i will tweet out this chart so if you follow me on twitter at nick underscore bdge either yesterday or this morning i will have tweeted out this chart and the tweet we will just say from today's running back video or whatever. So you guys can download it and look at it as we are going through it if it's too small on the YouTubes. So you see all the players on the left side there, right? Starting with Christian McCaffrey and going back to Chris Johnson down in 2009. And then their half PPR points per game is three columns over. Every one of them over 20 points per game. And y'all can see the labels on there. Fantasy points, touches, touches per game. We, we narrow down everything into per game numbers as well because some of them didn't play a full 16. Like I said, 12 game minimum. Wanted to make sure that we had everybody. One thing that stands out almost immediately was the passing work. 17 of the 20 league winning running backs over the last 12 years have had 65 plus targets on the year and over four targets per game. So that seems to be give or take the baseline of what you need in the passing work to to finish the season as a, a legit league winner of over 20 points per game. So the first thing that pops into your mind is a, is a guy like Derrick Henry. Like he ain't gonna have 65 targets on the year. It's also why he didn't make it on the list. Was Derrick Henry really, really good for fantasy last year? Yes. Did he win you your league? Probably not, because the guy who had Christian McCaffrey likely won your league. So being involved in the receiving game, if you aren't sure, is is, is pretty, pretty fucking important if you want to hit any sort of ceiling in fantasy football. So those three that did not hit the ceiling, right? We said 17 of 20 had 65 plus targets and averaged over four targets per game. The three that did not, we had Zeke in 2016, which was his rookie year. We had DeMarco Murray also in Dallas two years prior where he had that 450 touch workload. We had AP all day. 2012, where he fell eight yards shy of breaking Eric Dickerson's 2,105 single season rushing yard record. So what did these three have in common? How did they fade receiving work and still end up as league winners? Let's look at the right side of the chart. No surprise, offensive line. That was peak Dallas, bully, dominant offensive line for those years. DeMarco Murray, Ezekiel Elliott. Ranked number five overall in 2016 for Zeke. Ranked number two for DeMarco in 2014 in terms of run blocking. The Vikings, that year the AP went off in 2012, were the number three ranked run blocking line. These numbers are per both pro football focus and football outsiders. So 
If we got a guy who's not going to be very involved in pass catching, that old line better be bullying motherfuckers. The other thing I noticed and I loved is that whole like 20 plus carry per game narrative. So even for a league winning back is so far overblown. If you look at that carry per game column, it's like third to the right. It has a lot of red in there. And anyone that I marked off as red had fewer than 20 touches per game. 12 of the 20 league winning running backs here. So 60% of them average 18.6 carries per game or fewer. We had a 17.9, a 16.3, a 14.6, 13.7, 12.9, 17.3. As we know in fantasy, a target and a reception is worth far more than a single carry. So being on a good offense obviously translates as well, more scoring opportunities. As I said, you know, targets and receptions are worth a lot more than a single carry. Well, a carry inside the 10-yard line is also worth exponentially more than just a normal carry outside of the 10-yard line. So the better your offense is, obviously, the more you're staying on the field, the more overall opportunity you're getting, the more scoring chances you have. So of the 20 running backs on this list, 19 of the 20, 95% of them we're on an offense inside the top half of the league's scoring offenses. So top 16 in the league or better. Ironically, only Christian McCaffrey, who was the single highest points per game scorer on this entire list, was the only one not on a good offense. Carolina's his offense last year ranked 20th in the league in scoring. So every offense that a league winning running back has been on over the last 12 years has been on a top 20 scoring offense. 19 of 20 have been on a top half scoring offense. So if you're a bottom 12 offense, the chance of you being a league winning running back are pretty much zero. 14 of the 20 running backs or 70% of them were on a team that was ranked top 12 in scoring. Nine of 20, 45% of them were on a team that was ranked top six in scoring. That's a pretty substantial percentage for a very narrow margin of where your team can land in scoring. So again, top scoring offense obviously makes this a much, much easier feat to accomplish. Okay. Okay. So those are a lot of numbers being thrown around. How can we put this into practical use? So what I wanted to do was make another chart. This one's a little bit very simple. Very, very simple to decipher. Looking at the running backs of this year's crops. And which ones do we think could possibly make this happen? Which of these guys legitimately have league winning upside? I took C-Mac off the list. I took Saquon off the list. I took Zeke off the list because they've already been on the list, right? So I wanted to look at running backs that are drafted probably within the first like three or so rounds that I think could possibly fit the mold. Or at least people are excited about fitting the mold. And here is the chart I came away with. We narrowed it down again. It's a very, very simplistic chart, but I think it helps see a bird's eye view of what the realistic ceiling for a lot of these guys are. So basically, I put catches 50 plus passes. Is their offense top 12? And is their run blocking unit also top 12? For the second two, the offense being in the top 12, I just took last year's points per game numbers and uh, O-line run blocking also last year's numbers. So obviously, there's a little bit of change. And we're going to go into the nuance of some of these guys individually and talk about whether or not I think they legitimately have that league winning upside. In terms of catch 50 passes, this was not based on last year's numbers. This is based on whether or not they've already done it or you can actually project them to do it in 2020. I tried to be as unbiased as possible. So for any of the guys that were like in the middle that didn't actually hit the threshold, but are kind of like right on the border, I put a blue check mark there for any guys that are definitely not in that top 12 or definitely not catching 50 plus passes this year. I just put a, a flat out red no and, and then green for the other one. So no surprise using this criteria, Dalvin Cook is green across the entire board. He basically was in that threshold last year. He averaged like 19 points per game, so he didn't technically qualify. But the next guy up on this list that checks off two and a half boxes is Miles Sanders. And this is not a surprise to me whatsoever. I really, truly believe he has league winning upside. I think he has like Aaron Jones last year-ish upside with more consistency in terms of, of volume and not worrying about a guy like Jamal Williams coming on the field and getting his days. The question becomes, you know, as his price continues to soar into the first round, are you okay with the downside or the possibility of him becoming a running back by committee? Like, it's great that some of these guys have league winning upside, but that doesn't mean that they have no downside either. As we saw in the previous chart, though, like you don't need 20 plus carries a game. Most of them are at 18 or 17, which is probably right around Sanders' wheelhouse of what I'm assuming that he will do week over week. And they have not brought in a veteran yet. So I like his chances of still being the only guy in that backfield. And then 50 catches for sure. I mean, he did that last year in a limited role. So their offense put it blue for top 12 because they were number 15 last year. But I do think they're a lot healthier this year and they have a very good chance of finishing within the top 12. They did it without like 70% of their weapons last year. So it should be better offense in 2020. The big problem that surfaced recently was, of course, Brandon Brooks. He will be out for the entirety of the year. And he was literally PFF's top graded offensive guard in the NFL. 
number one for run blocking, and that obviously hurts. So Howie better be on the fucking phones trying to get Jason Peters' bike on the line. So this is going to be a big blow to them. They finished comfortably with, within the top 12 last year in terms of run blocking units. So do they fade away to the middle of the pack? I still believe they could be a very decent run blocking unit in 2020, despite Brooks not being there. And Sanders is one of those guys that, like, I think he's more explosive and he makes plays out in the open field. So I'm not as worried about him averaging three yards per carry up the middle instead of like 4.2. I don't think that's a huge, huge deterrent from me. So I'm, I'm still I'm still on board with Sanders here as someone who has league winning upside potential. And again, I won't go through all the players, but also no surprise that Derrick Henry's at the top of the list here. He almost did it last year. As we said, if you're not catching passes, the O-line better be damn good. Last year, they were number five overall in run blocking. Their offense was number eight overall. That Roger Saffold signing was absolutely brilliant by them last offseason he finished as the number five overall graded guard in 2019 one thing to note here though right the reason the rams line started to deteriorate is because they got rid of guys like roger saffold right jack conklin who was a huge piece of the tennessee offense and their offensive line last year number six overall graded run blocking tackle in the nfl last year is now on cleveland so y'all can take a look at the rest of the list uh but i kind of want to finish on the bottom here pause the bottom of this chart grow up you see joe mixon and nick chubb and i think people's imaginations are, are kind of running wild on these two and are not registering that these guys aren't ceiling plays they are floor plays if we're going to be honest with each other mixon can he catch 50 passes yes i mean i straight up wanted to put no but i knew that people would be mad and they'd be annoying in the comment section so i left it at maybe for you is he capable of doing it sure but what over the last three years has told you that he will his career high in targets is 55 receptions is 43 he took a step back in the receiving game last year, despite this team finishing 30th in scoring. And here, here's a big motherfucking fact for you. Go follow me on Twitter. There wasn't a single team last year that ran more offensive plays while trailing than the Cincinnati Bengals. They ran 495 plays while trailing. Despite this, Joe Mixon's passing work went from 3.9 targets a game in 2018 to 2.8 targets a game in 2019. 3.1 receptions a game in 2018 to 2.2 receptions a game in 2019. That added with the fact that they were the 30th ranked offense last year, the 20th, 29th ranked run blocking unit. Will they take a step up from last year? Of course they will. With Joe Burrow coming in, Jonah Williams coming back. It's a massive step up. And, you know, I wouldn't even put past them flirting with like the top half in both of those rankings, maybe like 18 to 16 in that range. But again, if you're going to be a league winning upside, like some people think mixing can be, you need to check more boxes. Same goes with Chubb. I think we could safely say he's not catching 50 passes with Hunt there. I mean, you just look at the splits from last year. In the eight games that Kareem Hunt was on the field, Chubb averaged 2.25 targets and 1.4 receptions, which over a 16 game pace is 36 targets, 22 receptions. Chubb could still definitely see like 300 carries and he has that breakaway speed and the elusiveness. He's just an incredible runner to make a big fantasy impact. But like the Bengals with Mixon, they're a team who need an almost unpredictable offensive season for Chubb to fit that bill. Like one where they take such a huge step up from last year, which I don't think is, I guess, out of the realm of possibilities. But that's too much projection on upside to actually make that a realistic projection going into fantasy football. You know, I talk about the Titans losing Jack Conklin. The Browns are the one who grabbed him, right? They also took Tristan Wirfs with their first pick in this year's NFL draft. So their line is definitely going to be improved. And like we saw with Derrick Henry, that's what does get me excited about Chubb. If they have a very good offensive line, you have a very good runner with the volume. It's possible that he gives you that upside. But none of the backs that accomplished that feat without catching passes had Kareem Hunt in their backfield. He's literally an all pro. He literally won the rushing title his rookie season in the NFL. This guy is 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 too good for Chubb to get 75% of the touches. And that's what you're going to need to be a league winning running back. Chubb's a good second round pick, but I don't think he has a league winning upside till 2021. Wouldn't be surprised if Chubb is like the 103 next year in drafts. But right now, I think he's a much better second round pick than he's a first round pick. So I think we got to pull the brakes back on that. That's most of the deep dive that I had for y'all today. I thought it was a little bit of a different pace that I can give you, not so specific on like one topic and then listing a few players, but a, a deep dive analytically or as analytically as my dumb ass can get. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. I do have a few other things to plug here. Obviously, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up. If you're listening via podcast, a rating and review would be fun. And subscribe to the channel if you're new, because we'll be doing fantasy football shit like this five days a week week speaking of a week one week from tomorrow the draft guide drops the big dogs draft guide that we put together every summer the season-long draft guide with our top sleepers our top busts our must draft players round by round We've got our season-long rankings half ppr ppr standard i write up the big dogs bible which is like a forty-two thousand word piece exactly how to attack your fantasy football draft this year position by position 
round by round. It's the best thing you could possibly buy in the fantasy football industry. And I put the fucking big dog stamp on that. There's no doubt in my mind. The best way to get it, going on Monkey Knife Fight and depositing $10 with the promo code BDG. So monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 bucks, And you're going to get $25 on Monkey Knife Fight. I was just told that you actually get $25 because of a promo that they're running. So $25 to play with just from your $10. The Big Dogs season-long draft guide for free. You'll get the Big Dogs rookie dynasty draft guide for free. You'll get Dr. Morse's injury guide, which is a rating for every injured player going into the season for free. All you have to do is deposit $10 on Monkey Knife Fight. If you're a first-time depositor, you got to play a game on there. Play a game of like $2 on there, and you will get everything for free. They'll notify me, which is when I'll give you access via email. If you're not in a state that's eligible for Monkey Knife Fight, then you got to just go cop the guide on BigDogsDraftGuide.com. It is still on pre-order pricing until next week. July 1st, one week from tomorrow, it drops. The world done changed forever. I love you. Hit that thumbs up button. See you tomorrow.